Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here in this uh, excellent uh, workshop. Um, I, I've attended several of the talks and they're really, really intriguing and interesting. So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about these uh, ultra thin endoscopes that we have been developing. I, I, first, I would like to uh, give a brief uh, description of uh, things we've been doing uh, in our lab. Uh, in general, our research is on computational optical imaging. And uh, in computational imaging, what we have is uh, the marriage of uh, optical and computational techniques using advanced algorithms. So we, we take uh, full advantage of the capability of uh, controlling the illumination, uh, the detection and the optical system using unconventional optics to produce um, uh, performance of optical systems that uh, challenge the traditional limitations. For example, as uh, uh, Lionel said, we've been developing uh, systems that control the point spread function for achieving three-dimensional imaging, such as the double helix point spread function that you might have heard. And with that, we, we apply that to super resolution microscopy and uh, where you can do multicolor uh, uh, imaging using techniques such as uh, palm and storm, but uh, over a longer uh, uh, range, both in uh, uh, axial direction and transfer direction and achieving the limits of uh, the uh, resolution that are uh, implied by the kremitzer hour lower bound, uh, which is a metric for, for precision. So uh, without getting to that topic, which has been covered extensively today, uh, another area that we cover is imaging through scattering media, uh, such as tissue, uh, using uh, uh, techniques that we call adaptive imaging, where we, again, we control the the systems using uh, spatial modulators and temporal modulation to uh, obtain information about the scattering and uh, focus an image through scattering media and sometimes aided by the fluorescence or uh, photoacoustic effects. Um, we've also traditionally been working on the diffractive optics and meta optics. In particular, we develop uh, volume meta optics. Essentially, you can think of uh, three dimensional face masks that enable uh, multiple functions to be encoded in a single element. And then uh, finally, and the topic of today, we're going to be uh, talking about these micro endoscopes, uh, which uh, I think it's a very exciting area. So um, before I continue, I want to acknowledge the people that uh, have been working on this project as usual, the students at postdocs and collaborators are critical. Um, most of the work here was developed by Antonio Caravaca, uh, who was a student and then a postdoc in, in my lab. Don Conkey, uh, also Sakshi Singh and Evelyn, also Omar Tsang who, and Eyal Niv, who were a postdoc and student. Simone Lawes also was a student, uh, sorry, a postdoc in our group. And Shai Oyun was a um, postdoc in Professor Di Carlo. And he was really um, instrumental in uh, creating the first in vivo experiments with these uh, ultra thin endoscopes. Another thing uh, that um, I want to emphasize here is that our lab works. Uh, um, heavily on trying to uh, transition our discoveries to, to industry. We have a span of two companies, one to develop um, and commercialize the point spread function engineering uh, techniques. And the second one is uh, Modendo Inc. It's a more recent one uh, to in, uh, commercialize the endoscopic uh, techniques. 
So um, in microendoscopy, it's, it's, a, it's not a new topic. It's a, the idea is to do a deep, minimal invasive imaging beyond what you could ever think of doing uh, with optics. Uh, of course, uh, uh, with optics, you can do two photon, you can do three photon microscopy, uh, OCT. There are different techniques, even uh, optical diffusion tomography. The problem with the optical diffusion is you have very limited resolution. And the other techniques, you have a limitation of one millimeter, two millimeter. That's the best you can hope for. And in, so in, in any other case, if you want to go deeper in the order of centimeters, you have to have some invasiveness. And then the, the goal is to achieve minimally damage in, in tissue. And that's our goal here. Now, uh, traditional techniques use uh, bundles of uh, single mole fibers uh, attached, uh, tightly attached to create, uh, uh, essentially each fiber creates one pixel of the image and all the fibers together create an image. The problem uh, is that uh, these fibers are relatively uh, thick. We are talking one millimeter at least. Uh, or typically, and if, if you go thinner, you are uh, having a trade-off with the number of fibers you can pack. So uh, uh, this is uh, appropriate for using cavities, right? So, and it's used in, in medical imaging uh, widely. Uh, for um, more uh, exploratory research, for example, in brain image, People are using a green endoscopes and green are a grid index lenses, which are essentially cylinders of glass. And this can be a uh, transmit an image if cut at the uh, right uh, distance, but uh, they are still uh, relatively thick. Uh, maybe uh, the thinnest uh, probably around 300 microns, but uh, there is a trade-off. If you make them thinner, then they are very short and they are rigid and so in practice they are not that good if you want to go really deep so th then the, the the question from a fundamental point of view is uh, okay what what is the thinnest we can go where is the thinnest mechanism we can transmit the information optical information uh, and so one could think of just one degree of freedom uh, through um, and then do temporal encoding. So one degree of freedom is a single mole fiber, essentially a fiber that transmits a single pixel. And then you have uh, some temporal mechanism that converts the, the special information on the distal side to uh, temporal information. So um, you need to have, for example, if you're looking into the brain, you think of a fiber yeah, and then you need some type of a encoding, encoder, some system that you put at the end of the fiber to convert a 3D image into a one-dimensional signal. And then on the other side of the fiber, you have a decoding mechanism. Now, the problem with this, uh, uh, this mechanism to achieve an image is that uh, whatever you put on the, on the distant end of the fiber is going to be relatively thick. And they, they have uh, techniques that, for example, have some scanning mechanism or uh, some ways of uh, gratings to convert pulses into temporal information. But anything you can think of uh, placing in the distal side of the fiber is going to uh, occupy a cross section that is thicker than the cross section of the fiber. And so we defeat the purpose of having a minimal invasive uh, mechanism. So um, then the next uh, in line is to have a multi-mode fiber, essentially a fiber that can transmit multiple modes. And uh, the, the, these fibers are attractive because fundamentally it, you can pack the maximum number of spatial modes uh, if you have a, a fiber like this. And uh, there are also, there is people using, for example, a, a, multi-core fibers, which is some type of multi-mode fibers. But the idea is to make the thinnest uh, fiber. So uh, typically we use um, um, fibers that have a core that has a higher index uh, and with a parabolic or a flat top uh, 
cross-section. Now, uh, because they, we can pack the highest number of mode, each mode can be converted into special information. So we have a smallest cross-section. The other advantage is that uh, they can bend, and that's an advantage of uh, roads, roads of uh, uh, green uh, lenses. They have a relatively low cost, uh, although I, that I expect with the specialization of fibers, these are going to become more expensive. But uh, also importantly, they also enable multiple modalities of imaging, uh, as we are going to see today. So a multimodal fiber, as I mentioned, can transmit uh, different spatial modes. You can also transmit different colors and pulses. Uh, the problem with these uh, fibers is that uh, if we think in a geometrical point of view, uh, each uh, mode corresponds to rays that bounce at different angles. And now, uh, while one could think of each mode as a perfectly nice uh, two-dimensional function, as shown here, this is a set of modes from a multimodal fiber, what happens when all these modes are uh, overlapped because each mode uh, propagates a different uh, with different phase velocity, one uh, ends up with a speckled pattern at the end if we, of course, use coherent light. So the interference of, of all these modes uh, produces a speckled pattern. To make things worse, uh, any perturbations is going to uh, change these speckled patterns. Uh, and so perturbations could be bending of the fiber, temperature changes, uh, defects uh, through the fiber, etc. And these changes uh, can occur uh, mostly because there is mode coupling. Essentially, a mode is that is launched through this fiber is going to convert to a superposition of other modes at the output. So the whole thing is how to control or undo this distortion, which in principle is uh, deterministic. And the basic concept is more than 50 years old. And actually the first demonstration using uh, holography was done in 1967. Um, the problem with this uh, demonstration is that they, they were very elementary and they use coherent light and also require uh, the use of the fiber and basically access to the distal side of the fiber, didn't use fluorescence and so on. So uh, these were nice uh, laboratory demonstrations. And despite being more than 50 years old, uh, no other technique, uh, so no, no demonstration of this technique has been uh, done in vivo until, until recently. Uh, over the years, different groups have uh, attempted to uh, propose new techniques as shown here, but in the last decade, yeah, this has uh, taken off again uh, and basically fueled by uh, new ideas on how to control light and also uh, by new technological advances. So we have better detectors, we have faster modulators, uh, better fibers, better computers to uh, reconstruct the images and so on. So going back to the original motivation, uh, if we think of a fiber bundle having around one micron in diameter and the green fiber having about, uh, sorry, a green lens having about uh, half a micron, we are talking about uh, multimodal fibers that have a hundred micron in diameter. So basically what we are looking at is about two orders of magnitude, a lower cross section. And that's what uh, will enable us to do uh, for minimal damage on, on whatever sample we, we are going to, to use this. So another uh, way of looking at this is uh, the, traditionally in a traditional microscope, the key element is the objective lens. Basically the rest is a uh, optomechanics around it and means to uh, introduce light and uh, detect the light. But the, from an optics point of view, the key element is the objective. Now, in, in our case, the key element is the optical fiber, and we can think of the fiber as our new objective. 
And in order to uh, create the images, we need to have a, a, a box that includes sources, modulators, detectors, and computation. So uh, let me uh, first explain uh, one of the techniques we use to create images. We identify two uh, steps. One is a calibration step where we calibrate the fiber. For that, we project, as shown here on the left, different orthogonal patterns through the fiber. And these patterns have to be coherent. And then we, on the distal side, we collect the uh, speckle patterns generated by those uh, different illumination patterns. Because we want to collect uh, the complex amplitude of light, we need to have a, a reference. And that reference can be sent outside the fiber or inside the fiber through this uh, frame. And uh, we prefer to do it through the fiber because then we have what is called a, a, a inline a interferometer. Essentially, the reference light goes through the same uh, fiber and uh, is uh, affected by the same distortions or perturbations. It's, it's, it's more stable. Uh, so we collect these images uh, in a camera, and that's our, our calibration. Uh, that calibration, uh, we can put it mathematically as a trans what is called a transmission matrix. The transmission matrix uh, essentially relates inputs to outputs of, of, a, of a medium. So um, now once we have that store, we can go to the eliminate this camera we had on the right and project patterns on the specialized modulator after introducing the fiber in the sample. When we project, uh, these patterns we project are such that they generate a spot on the output and we scan that spot on the output. So this would be similar to what you have in a confocal microscope. You have a scanning a spot over the sample, but now that is happening at the distal side of the fiber, which is introduced in the sample. The equations on the right they show how to do this calculation. Once we have the transmission matrix uh, here described by the T, M, N elements, this is shows it's essentially a, a related to phase conjugation if you have a background in holography. So once we scatter, uh, sorry, we scan a spot on the distal side, if uh, the sample is fluorescent, it's going to uh, generate fluorescence emission. We can collect the fluorescence light through the same fiber back into a photo detector and then uh, generate a time signal that can be associated with the location of the spot and generate a two dimensional image as shown here. So one of the main uh, problems with uh, fibers, uh, multi-mode fibers, is that uh, once we do the calibration, if the fiber is perturbed, uh, we lose the calibration. So uh, in, we've done experiments with uh, different types of fibers to show that uh, this, if the fiber is not uh, too long and the perturbation is not too dramatic, we can preserve the calibration. So here we see, we are focusing essentially on a spot and then moving the tip of the fiber by some distance in millimeters here. And it shows that uh, for some fibers, they, there is a decrease in the intensity of the spot as we bend the fiber. So this is an X, this is an Y. But for some other fibers, we see that things are quite uh, constant. And these uh, fibers are uh, fibers that are graded index fibers. And there is a theoretical background to explain why that, that is the case. So in other words, if the fiber is not too long, such that the perturbations are not propagated over long distance, and uh, we use the appropriate fiber, these perturbations are not so, so problematic. And in this uh, movie here on the right, we see that we kick the tip of the fiber, and then as the fiber goes back to its original position, we recover the, the spot. So um, 
this is something to be uh, aware of that the, uh, the, the calibration might degrade, but we have left these calibrations for days and for example, and things have not changed. Another uh, technological uh, aspect of this is the spatial modulation. We need to project patterns uh, on the input uh, spatial light modulator at high speed. And so we use this, um, it's called a DLP from Texas Instrument, which is an array of um, micro mirrors that can tilt as shown here on the right. So they, they have two states, uh, on and off. So it, this is basically a binary, a, a binary mask that we can control at high speed, more than 20 kilohertz. Uh, the problem with the binary mask is that uh, we need to generate uh, patterns that have uh, amplitude and phase. Essentially, we need to generate a hologram. And for that, we do uh, uh, actually holograms. We project a hologram, uh, we, what is called a computer-generated hologram. For example, if this is your pattern, your, your chessboard pattern, we can generate a hologram that encodes the information in amplitude and phase uh, using a carrier as shown here. So uh, with this technique, essentially, uh, we can uh, project a complex amplitude uh, um, patterns onto the fiber at high speed, which was one key element. Uh, later, we develop an even faster method using a, what is called a great a light valve, GLV. This is a one-dimensional array of uh, pixels. And uh, without going too much detail, this can uh, modulate at 350 kilohertz, so 10 times faster than the DLP. And here, just to demonstrate it, we are focusing here uh, through a moving diffuser on the left and through a dynamic medium here that is changing as, as we, in the order of milliseconds. And the idea is to have a feedback to recalibrate the transmission matrix. So uh, to emphasize, traditional um, spatial light modulators are based on uh, liquid crystal devices, and those uh, can modulate uh, typically in the order, the most advanced, uh, two, 300 hertz. The DLP goes at almost 30 kilohertz. So we are talking there uh, several orders of magnitude faster. And with this GLV, we can go much faster. So uh, using these techniques, we can really modulate light faster. And why is this important? Because we need to do uh, real time uh, measurements if we want to do, use this technique uh, through the multimode fiber. Okay, so going back to the to this uh, multiple fibers, the idea, uh, our first experiments were uh, in brain imaging using uh, animal models as mice. And as I mentioned, Chai Yun was a, a postdoc in, in the Carlos Group Instrumental in transferring this uh, for the in vivo experiments. So um, as I mentioned, 50 years, and uh, there have not been any in vivo experiments. So uh, that was our goal here. And to achieve that goal, we needed uh, to have uh, probes that have a small section uh, to be able to introduce in the brain. Uh, we also need to have micro scale resolution to image neurons, a uh, near uh, real time uh, capability uh, using the fast modulation. High collection efficiency. So the collection efficiency of a fiber is about is given by the numerical aperture, and these fibers can have a numerical aperture of uh, above 0.5, so it's uh, reasonably good. Um, we can do also multispectral, and the multispectral capability is done by uh, doing twice a calibration with different colors. Um, we can do volumetric imaging in two ways. One is um, uh, doing calibrations in different depth planes. 
The other way it would be to calculate in one plane and then use uh, wave propagation to calculate the patterns on a different uh, plane. So it can be done uh, experimentally uh, via calibration or uh, via a uh, numerical once one calibration plane is done. And the other thing uh, that is interesting, we, we don't need to scan raster scan, we can random access. So if, once we identify uh, where the neurons are, we can uh, interrogate each one individually and at random. So we, we can jump from neuron to neuron and that's a capability enabled here. So um, here are some images uh, with the fiber. The, these are with bees showing a 3D imaging, essentially looking at bees at different lo locations in depth on the top images. On the bottom imaging showing uh, two different fluorophores uh, with the same fiber image uh, as shown on the bottom right. Then the, the next experiment that uh, was done was uh, uh, with the live neurons, but in vitro. Uh, the, the neuroscientists know how to slice a slice of brain and uh, keep them alive and uh, firing. So you, you can put that into a microscope and, and do uh, essentially optogenetics. And so here, what we did is uh, on one side, we had a microscope on the uh, epifluorescence, the one in the middle here. On the other side, we have the fiber scope, the, the, the multiple fiber endoscope. And uh, we see that there is a high correlation between the two images, one uh, as shown on the overlap on the right. And then the um, traces, uh, time traces on the bottom show also the same correlation. And of course, the images obtained with the fiber are going to have more noise than the images obtained with the epifluorescence microscope. But um, there is a high correlation so in the, the, the information is there. Um, this shows uh, the section done in, in the skull uh, and then the introduction of the fibers through the skull. So the, the movie on the right shows the, the the video of the as the fiber is introduced in the brain. So um, for comparison, uh, people using uh, rows of uh, green lenses need to do uh, let the the mouse uh, multiple days until the, it heals because of the damage uh, produced by the green lenses, which are uh, again uh, 10 times uh, in area or more. And so here we can do the experiment right away. Uh, these show um, fluorescence, time average fluorescence images uh, at multiple depths. And these show different uh, uh, activity of different neurons, uh, separating what is a, actually a neuron firing from what is background. Okay, and uh, this one uh, shows the traces and the time trace on the on the movie. We see a time trace of from a neuron and from uh, the background. So um, this experiment was exciting because it was actually the first in vivo experiment uh, after fifty years of a uh, different uh, development. So um, uh, it. Uh, which has to try to solve some of the problems that still uh, are here. So um, one is the time. There's uh, different ways of the, uh, accelerating the time of acquisition. And one would be to, as I showed, to use faster modulators. But another uh, technique is to use uh, what is called compressive imaging. The idea here is to, instead of uh, projecting a, a known, uh, sorry, a, a known or arrays of uh, patterns at the input, we can project random patterns and measure only the intensity at the output, okay? So here the calibration is much simpler because there's no phase uh, information. And then uh, once we have the calibration, we project as a subset of these random patterns, which have to be the same, and they are overlapping with the sample and generating a fluorescent that is also collected. 
Now this fluorescent information has to be reconstructed with some uh, type of a reconstruction algorithm. It's not a direct imaging as before, but it, it can also work. Uh, for this algorithm, essentially we take into account that we have a speckle pattern overlap with the object, and then we have a, a fluorescence emission. So um, if we know the fluorescence patterns because we measure in the calibration step, then we can do a reconstruction using, for example, we, we try different methods, but uh, one example is this uh, FISTA algorithm, which essentially uh, is an optimization algorithm imposing a positivity constraint because we know fluorescence is, is a positive signal. With this, um, this algorithm takes some time, but not terrible, depends on a little bit on the capability of the computer and can also be parallelized. So um, they can be really fast in the reconstruction. And the, what is uh, most important is that uh, these are fluorescent beads inside a brain sample, actually, uh, not ex vivo. But what you can see here is that uh, even with an order of magnitude uh, in reduction in the number of the measurements, we can uh, reconstruct uh, the image. There is, of course, a, a penalty. So the fewer number of uh, 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 measurements we make, the, there's going to be a penalty in, in mean square error in, or uh, as a metric. But uh, still, um, in general, one can think of uh, reducing by an order of magnitude the, the acquisition time using compressive uh, imaging. Another interesting aspect is uh, if you have enough signal to noise, you can use this, uh, this technique to improve the quality. So, you can use it the other way around. So you say, well, I have a, I have time, so I'm going to use this technique to, to improve the, the quality of the reconstruction. And also, uh, actually, you can do a super resolution. But the, this is very sensitive to the signal-to-noise ratio. As usual, this is one of the, uh, for those that are not in image science, every time you use a, a multiplex technique like this one where you eat it, uh, don't use direct imaging, there is a penalty in SNR. And so um, you have to be careful when and if to use this type of techniques and uh, what the trade-offs are. So uh, I think I have time for this. Uh, another interesting thing that we observe is uh, this is a more theoretical uh, aspect is if we can control the modes that are uh, transmitted through the fiber, then we can uh, improve the, the robustness to perturbations. And, and so uh, here we, what we try is to control the modes transmitted through the fiber. Uh, traditional, so fibers, as you probably know, are, are mostly used for telecommunications and there's been a recent uh, interest in using fibers for um, multi-mode fibers for transmitting more information. But uh, these are typically what people call few mode fibers with fibers, in other words, fibers with uh, 10, 20 modes. And uh, while we are talking about uh, fibers with thousands of modes, 10,000 modes is what we need to get a, uh, to get a nice image. So when in communication, what people think of transmitting one mode is they want to send one mode and collect the same mode on the other side. Our problem is a little bit different. We have a what we call a myriad a fiber, a myriad mode fiber, essentially a fiber that has thousands of modes. And what we want is to uh, have a, a, a mode decomposition at the output that uh, fits our constraints. For example, we want to have only the higher or the most tr transmitted at the output. Um, so the problem is a little bit different of uh, what people do in communications. And we have two uh, metrics. One is the mode control efficiency, which is the ratio of energy in the selected modes to the energy in all the modes. So if we want to have all the energy in the lower modes and we have 10% of the energy in the higher modes, then we say that we have 90% efficiency. And then uh, the special control fidelity, essentially 
how a uh, good is a signal uh, with respect to what we want to achieve is we use this uh, Pearson correlation coefficient, think of some type of correlation to see that uh, what we created in the fiber matches uh, what we want. So in this, um, yeah, in this movie, uh, on the left, we have a target field at the output, and the, on the right, we have a, a digitally, uh, digitally computed output field that we would get at the distal end of the fiber. In other words, uh, the, the, the fiber has tens of thousands, sorry, thousands of modes, I think of 10,000, and we have a specialized modulator with a limited number of pixels, so we, we cannot control everything, but we can still do a good job of controlling eh, the output if we have uh, a good algorithm. So uh, what this tells you is that uh, there is a way of controlling the signals at the output of the multiple fiber, and controlling the modes can enable to also uh, control the uh, robustness of the fiber. Okay, uh, another thing. So as I mentioned, the, this, uh, the fiber is basically, you can consider it as an objective, and you can think of uh, performing basically any imaging modality you can you know from microscopy through the multiple fiber. And in particular, we 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 have been interested in super resolution. So uh, we try uh, we, we try to develop this uh, multi-view scanning confocal microscopy translated to the multiple fiber. The ISM microscopy was mentioned earlier today consists of a imaging, it's essentially a confocal where you have multiple pinholes. And then for each pin, pinhole, you generate a, a new image that then can be combined by pixel or assignment or some other sophisticated algorithm to basically increase the resolution, I would say by a factor of square root of two in, in resolution. But the, the main advantage arguably is that the, in the signal to noise ratio, because now you collect more information as, as was mentioned earlier as well. Uh, each of the images, the lateral images have a lower SNR, so uh, you need to look for a, a way of combining these things. So ISM is, is successful. There are commercial products out there, but only applies uh, for when you have an objective, you have a regular lens, and basically more fundamentally to what we call shift invariant systems. We would like to apply this to the multiple fiber endoscope. So what we have is, um, if we look, uh, you know, in, in a confocal microscope, you see, a, you, you put a lens and then you focus and you have a, you can put a pinhole. But here we get a, on the backward a, a light coming through the fiber. If it's coherent for now, we get a speckle pattern. So uh, how do we get a, a confocal mechanism? What we need to do is a phase conjugation of that and refocus that. To refocus that, what we need is to know the transmission matrix on and the backward propagation. So uh, to uh, characterize the fiber not only in the forward but backward, and then we can phase conjugate that and refocus the light. Okay, so the light, we know how to generate a focus on the bird here. Now the light that is reflected back through the fiber, we need to refocus it again to do the confocal makers. And uh, basically th this can be done either uh, optically or numerically. Um, and so once you have this uh, spot refocus, which we do with um, numerically in this, in this uh, presentation, you can put multiple detectors there, similar to ISM, and improve the uh, signal to noise ratio and the resolution. Then you need to find a way of combining the images that uh, gives you better uh, information as well. So um, basically, it's, it's a generalization of uh, ISM to the case of the of this type of uh, shift variant systems, and in particular for a multi-mode fiber. Uh, we call the technique uh, multi-view scattering scanning imaging confocal or MUSIC microscopy. 
So the system is going to look something like this. Uh, you have a laser, you have a spatial light modulator similar to what we had before. And then uh, you focus through, you know, some quarter wavelets, etc. Through you focus through the fiber. You have a calibration system here. You use only to calibrate. That fiber then goes into the sample. But then on the detection, you don't have a bucket detector. You have a camera. And this camera, uh, you need to collect, uh, in principle, amplitude and phase. Or you can get the intensity and then recover the phase. With that, then you can do phase conjugation and get refocus the image. So here are some results. Uh, this is, again, for coherent. It's not uh, uh, fluorescence on the um, upper image. Uh, we, we want to know uh, to show the sectioning capability. Uh, when you have a confocal, you have sectioning capability you don't, that you don't have with the wide field imaging. So on the top, we see the traditional image, the way we I explained it originally. On the bottom, we see the imaging of this. This is the Air Force chart. This is uh, not in vivo, of course. And this uh, chart is moved out from the fiber, and then you can see that the image disappears. So basically showing that you re reject a out of focus light. So the main thing is uh, we have the sectioning capability of this technique. And uh, also we want to show that you have better signal to noise as shown here uh, with different cross sections of the of these uh, images. Uh, here we have a one pinhole, here we have nine pinholes, and here we have 25 pinholes. And this is the image you'd get with the, without the pinholes. So as you can see, we increase the contrast or the signal to noise for this technique. So this is um, initially experimental results. And there are many, many ways we one can think of improving uh, this. But the, the key is that uh, one can uh, do confocal type of imaging through a multimodal fiber. So um, as I mentioned, we, we are trying to disseminate this through and commercialize this through a spin-off company. So we want to go through this. This is the actually the second version of the system for that was used for in vivo imaging. Uh, has a size of two meters square a cube about. And we want to build uh, boxes that are more uh, robust and easy to, to, to use more. Uh, uh, compact also, and that can be translated into other laboratories. Um, so th this is a first prototype of the system where uh, here, uh, this is a software, the initial software in, in Python, where this is taken uh, in real time images of a slide of a brain. And now we, we are going to see how you can do a, this shows you the, the, the real-time uh, capability, but now it's going to also show you, you can zoom in and focus on uh, region of, of interest and so on. Now focusing on the region. And now the system is only scanning that area. Mm -hmm that's shown on the upper, or oh, sorry, on the right. Okay, so um, to summarize, uh, we show that multimodal fibers are attractive for minimal invasive in vivo imaging. The idea, again, is to go uh, uh, deeper than what any other te optical technique can achieve. Uh, to, they can do multimodality. You can do confocal type of uh, imaging, scanning, structure, specular illumination, and etc. cetera. A group at um, uh, Germany and uh, Czech Republic, they, ca they have uh, done even non-linear imaging, cars type of imaging. And they, they also have done a very, very nice work in in vivo about um, 
in the last few years as well. Um, then the music uh, microscopy is uh, one way of uh, improving the, uh, the imaging by se sectioning and improving the SNR. And then uh, we show that this uh, can be put in a system that is modular and uh, robust to, to generate images. And hopefully it's going to be available for others to use in the, in the near future. I would like to acknowledge